December 13, 2020, less than two weeks before Christmas Day. I know everybody's excited, looking forward to celebrating that holiday. Uh, just a few announcements uh, before we get started. Um, each and every day we're continuing on with our 25 Christmas ends in 25 days daily devotion. It's at 10 o'clock each and every day on our church's uh, Facebook page. If you miss any of the sessions or have trouble finding the sessions or if they cut off on you in the middle of a, of a session, uh, they're all saved on our church's Facebook page. They're also saved on a YouTube channel that I have set up for that very purpose. Uh, what I may try to do is later on this afternoon is to email the link out to everybody to the YouTube channel so you'll be able to find it. And, uh, if you have any issues, any questions, any concerns, find them and be sure to, uh, to let me know. Um, I included in the bulletin. Uh, and uh, also sent to you via email and on your Facebook uh, our Doe Holy Night Christmas activity. What it is roughly, it's a video you can watch online that has a recipe to make Christmas cookies, to make snickerdoodles, uh, that allows you to make cookies with your family, to watch a video that uh, tells a specific story in a different way. There's a hymn uh, during it as well. So uh, if you got the email, forward it to as many family and friends as you have had, you think might be interested in it. It's about half an hour or so total the video, of course, add on to the baking time for you. Anything, I think it's a pretty, pretty fun activity. Uh, this Saturday, the 19th at 7 o'clock, over at Sherry and I met the church. We're having a Christmas service. It's a candlelight service, uh, which really just means at the end of the little light candles and seeing silent night. It's not going to be all candlelight, so it's not, you know, not to strain your eyes to see everything while we're, we're there. But we'll sing hymns, we'll read scripture about the nativity story. Uh, it should be a good time. We'll take communion together. Uh, but again, that's at 7 o'clock on, uh, on Saturday, the 19th. And then coming up, two other uh, virtual offerings on the 24th on Christmas Eve is a service of lessons and carols uh, that the youth of the free churches have put together. That will be broadcast on our Facebook page at noon, 4, and 7 on Christmas Eve. And then Sunday, December 27th, our service here will be all virtual. Uh, our district superintendent is making a gift to all the churches uh, that, he, uh, that he's in charge of a virtual Christmas service. And so we'll, he'll send it to me. I'll upload it to our Facebook page. So on Sunday the 27th, uh, you can come here if you want to. We won't have worship in here. Uh, I said it will be on, the, on our church's Facebook page and the link again sent over to your uh, email address. I think that's it. Uh, what prayer requests, announcements, concerns, good news does anybody have that they want to share with the congregation this morning? Well, people will start playing the game. Come, Christ Jesus, be our guest, and may our lives by you be blessed. Come, God, with us, and free us from the false claims of the empires of this world. We are lonely for you and your peace. Come, Emmanuel, and dwell with us. Make us your people indeed, the people through whom you bring love and justice to the world. Come, Jesus, and reign. Claim your rightful place in our hearts and in the midst of our community. Plant the seeds of hope among us. Establish God's reign on earth. For we pray as you taught us, that God's reign may come in fullness on earth. Come, Lord Jesus. Friends, our opening hymn this morning can be found on page 203 of your hymnal, page 203, Hail to the Lord's Anointed, and we'll be singing verses 1 and 4, verses 1 and 4 on page 203.
celebrations of the season, our homes with their lights and tinsel, wreaths and ribbons. We want to lighten the darkness around us, bring beauty to the ugliness that wears us down. We decorate because it is tradition, because it lifts our hearts, because it makes us feel like children again. We deck our halls because company is coming. The prophet Isaiah smiled when he said, God will give a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. No matter how far we feel from the spirit of the season, God promises to decorate us with love and with joy. And so we light these candles as a sign of our joy in the beautiful things of this season. Not just the things that glitter and flash, but the deeper things, the beauty of the heart and the soul, the beauty of love shared in service and hospitality. We light this candle of joy because company is coming. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Well, friends, we come to our first reading of Scripture for this morning, and we await with joyous anticipation what the Lord would have revealed to us through His written word. I want to invite you to join me as we say together our prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your words proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from Paul's first letter that he sent to the church of Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 24. Again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 24. The Apostle Paul writes this. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful. And he will do this. My friends, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. Thank you, Thank you God. To God. Well, sisters and brothers, we come now to our time of confession before God and each other. And I know I mention it uh, every week, but it certainly bears repeating that um, this is an important part of our service. And so I implore you to treat it as such. Pray together, and the first part of the prayer will be a space of silence, and I just simply urge you in that space to think about the past week and those things that you did, said, or thought that you know God would not or is not pleased with. Bring those to the Lord, confess them, repent of them, and then make a pledge to do better uh, this upcoming week. Yes, God is just, but God is also merciful, willing to forgive us our sins should we come to him with an honest and contrite heart. So I invite you to join me now as we pray together a prayer of confession first in silence. We give thanks, O oh God, that you are unchanging that your concern for justice and righteousness was so strong that you came in human form to share that concern with us in person. We confess that all too often we hesitate to speak or act when we see people being treated unjustly. Forgive us, O oh God, for the times when we have been happy to hear the gospel without truly living it. Forgive us for uncaring attitudes when we base our opinion on another person's worth on what they own or how they look, on what they say or how they live, rather than accepting them for who they are, people made in your image. 
Forgive us when our longing to live simply and with humility is defeated by selfish desires for pursuing profits before seeking your will. Forgive us for placing our hope in other than the Christ child born in a poor stable. Our hope lies in the promise of your mercy, O God, extending to those who fear you from generation to generation. Heal, restore, and bless us, we pray, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. My friends, may the God of peace cleanse you through and through. The promise that we just read from the Apostle Paul's reading in 1 Thessalonians is that our spirit, soul, and body will be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we should rejoice then and give thanks as we receive forgiveness and healing in Christ's name. For it is in the name of Christ, friends, that you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you now to join me as we say with one voice our Apostles' Creed, which is after all our confession of faith, our statement of faith, the recitation, as it were, the things that we hold in our hearts and know to be true and what separates us from the rest of the world. But here now our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life sermon text this morning comes from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. If you remember the first Sunday of Advent, we also read from Isaiah, but we mentioned how it was kind of a different sounding Isaiah. Well, this one I think is one we're a little more familiar with, uh, particularly in this time of Advent. But this is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. But there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken, as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. My friends, again, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks be to God. We continue our Advent sermon series this morning based upon Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Now, last week we took a look at the old green grump himself and we came to a few conclusions. First, we discussed that what possibly could have caused the Grinch to become the Grinch. And we decided that it was isolation from his community that led him to his Grinchy ways. 
Being alone gets awful lonely and it cuts us off from our sources of love, nurture, and accountability. And without a community around him, the Grinch came to believe that hating Christmas and stealing it from the Who's was an acceptable thing to do. We also mentioned that some of his reasons for hating Christmas may have been legitimate. This season gives us plenty of reasons to be Grinchy from the busyness and the materialism and to the incessant noise, 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 noise that drowns out the still small voice of God that is attempting to break through all the clutter. And we also agree that all of us have a Grinch inside of us and we have to be mindful of that as we navigate the potential pitfalls of the Christmas season. And yet, in the end, we mention that there is always hope, even for the Grinch. Well, this morning, we travel to the other end of the spectrum, from the hatred and resentment of the Grinch to the joy and celebration of the Who's. These Who's are an interesting contrast to the Grinch. They come across just as joyful and celebratory as the Grinch is curmudgeonly and resentful. For every grimace from the Grinch, a Who hangs an ornament. For every time the Grinch frowns, there's a Who serving up another portion of roast beef. How do you explain the difference between the two? Community. We touched on it last week a little bit, but I think it bears further explanation this morning. The Grinch has isolated himself from the rest of the world. So the Who's, though, they live together in community. And for me, I think that's the foundational difference between the two. Now, you could argue that being in community with others is not always a source of joy, and you'd be right. After all, Dr. Seuss chose not to tell us about the time that the Who's got into an argument over what color lights to put on the Christmas tree, or about the two Who's who didn't talk to each other for a while because they couldn't agree on whether to serve turkey or ham for Christmas dinner. That's probably how they settled on roast beef. <laughs> but being in community is not always smiles and hand-holding and singing Yahoo Lore. And we know that. But there are positive, life-giving aspects of being in community that, that keeps us from devolving into Grinches. One thing the Who's do as a community is they eat together. The book says the Who's, young and old, would sit down to feast, and they feast, and they feast, and they feast, 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 feast. Personally, I think this proves that the Who's are not only disciples of Christ, but probably also Methodists. After all, at the end of the story, when we see the who's gathered around a big, long table, how could that be anything other than a potluck supper? <laughs> and that is one thing we do well is a potluck after worship. My friends will ask me what it's like to serve here. I say, well, perfect match because they like to cook and I like to eat. <laughs> and we all like to eat. But not just because it provides physical nourishment, but because our spirits are nourished when we break bread together. The other thing the Who's do as a community is that they sing together. Dr. Seuss tells us they stand hand in hand and the Who's would start singing. They sing and they sing and they sing, 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 sing. There's something about lifting our voices together that connects us on a soul level. Our Isaiah passage says to God, You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. The people rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. And we like to sing here, don't we? We all love the music here, don't we? Yeah, I know I do. Well, it's not very good at it. Gray the other night, honestly, when Heidi was discussing Christmas presents for me, said, what if we got dad singing lessons? <laughs> but I promise you there's not a voice teacher around that can do anything with me. But the Who's love to sing, which is yet another reason why I think that they may have been Methodist. We know that Charles Wesley wrote most of the hymns in our hymnal. Did you know that John Wesley actually had seven directions for singing the hymns that his brother Charles wrote? I guess it should come as no surprise that the founder of our denomination had a method for singing. But his fourth direction says this, sing lustily and with good courage. Beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep, but lift your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, nor more ashamed of it being heard. 
than when you sung the songs of Satan. <laughs> Lustily and with good courage. Then it's like the who's at the end of the story when they're all gathered around singing. I believe the great source of the who's joy comes from the fact that they eat and they sing together. But there's something even deeper, I think, here. A wider chasm that divides the branch of the who's. And I don't know what the who's are like the rest of the year, but I think we can all say with some confidence that they are extravagant at Christmas time in their Christmas celebration. They do Christmas up big. They indulge themselves. Now, I know we have a negative connotation with that word, indulge. It can mean to live with no self-control or to abandon all restraint and take in every desire and wish. And yes, some indulgences can be harmful, even at Christmas time. But the who's are indulging themselves in the joy of the season. They're not holding back in their festivities, their celebrations, or their scene. They let it all out, lifting their forks and their voices high to the point of where, even at the top of Mount Crump, the Grinch can hear them singing their praise. Rather than trying to measure their joy or keep it at a reasonable or an acceptable level, they fully immerse themselves in the food and the song and the spirit of the season. On the other hand, the Grinch has chosen to cut himself off from that source of joy. Rather than join the Who's in their indulgences, he looks with disdain upon their celebrations, telling himself it's better to take away their joy then join in. Now I said last week there are parts of this season that are easy to hate, like the bills and the traffic and the noise, but in the Grinch's attempt to remove those parts of the season by stealing it from the news, he has cut himself off from the moments of joy or transcendence of incarnation. It's like refusing to come to church because you don't want to have to hunt down a parking place. The more we try to cut ourselves off from potential sources of joy, the more we feed the Grinch that is inside of us. I think it's interesting that Dr. Seuss tells us the Grinch has been dealing with this problem for 53 years. 53 years he has been resenting the Who's for their happiness. That is a long time to hold a grudge, isn't it? It's obvious that this grudge against the Who's has worn down the Grinch to the point that he's ready to do something drastic and illegal and downright unchristmassy to stop it. And yet, even when he takes away their Christmas, the Who's don't hold the grudge. They sing. And on this third Sunday of Advent, having lit the pink joy candle in the Advent wreath, when we celebrate the coming of the Prince of Peace, I want to ask you, are there any grudges in our lives that keep us from sin? Any conflicts that are holding us back from indulging in the joy of this season? You see, the Who's didn't let their conflict with the Grinch stop them at Christmas. Their joy almost bounces off the page if you read the book or bounces off our TV screens if we watch the cartoon. And we see them decorating their houses, playing with their toys, serving the Christmas feast. They truly embody the spirit of the season as they indulge themselves in the trimming, the wrapping, and the eating. And ironically, these are the very things the Grinch hates them for and are the very things that we sometimes criticize about this season. We see people go overboard with their Christmas lights or putting them up way too early or leaving them up way too late. We see people go overboard on their shopping zeal or their extravagant parties and we say, have they forgotten the reason of the season? As if Christmas is an either or holiday. Either you fully buy into the commercialism or you reverently worship at the manger, but you can't do both. Or can you? You see, the Who's do indulge themselves in all the holiday trappings, but when those things are taken away from them, they don't sulk. They sing. They sing because they know the meaning of Christmas is not tied up in those things. How do we respond? Would Christmas still be Christmas for us if we decided not to decorate? Or were forced to cut back on how much we could spend? Or share a simple meal rather than a who-like feast? I think the who's provide us an important self-check here. How many of you have said, and I know I've said it, that it doesn't feel like Christmas? 
What does that mean? <laughs> Doesn't every day feel like Christmas? If you believe in the incarnationality of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, born and new to us each and every day, we wake up and are filled with the mercy, love, and joy of our Creator. I think if all the things we expect or that we come to expect around Christmas were gone, Christmas carols, Christmas cookies, Christmas parties, exchange of Christmas gifts, would it still be Christmas for us? It was for the Who's. To proclaim their Christmas joy in spite of the Grinch's actions. Now, would it be fair to say that it was their love for Jesus that led them to this? I don't know, maybe Dr. Seuss doesn't tell us. I think we can say that they were able to join hands and sing on Christmas morning because there were hands to hold and other people with whom to sing. It didn't matter they didn't have any of the stuff they normally indulged in. All that mattered was that they had joy in the hearts, in their hearts, and a community to share it with. I want to go back real quick to something I mentioned a little bit earlier about the big, long food table that they have the feast at at the end of the story. In the book, when Dr. Seuss tells us how the Who's love the feast on Who pudding and Who roast beef, we see this picture of a long, curvy table decorated with candelabras and ribbons. While out of the kitchen comes all these servers, and they're bringing platters of dishes that contain scrumptious food casseroles. The chairs at the table are filled with Who's that all have these big grins on their faces. They anticipate what they're getting ready to eat. They have tall Who's and short Who's and young Who's and old Who's and male news and female news. And it looks like at a hoot feast, there's room for everyone at the table. No one is excluded from participating in the meal. Everyone has a place. There's something to be said for a community where there is room for everyone, where everyone feels welcome and valued, where everyone is invited to take and eat the meal that is offered to them. You know what that reminds me of? Communion. The invitation that we normally use at the beginning of our communion liturgy says this, Christ our Lord invites to his table who? All who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. We believe that everyone has a place at God's table, and that we will all sit together one day at the heavenly banquet. That meal, that good news, should prompt us to sing and shout words of praise and joy every day. Everyone is invited. And if you know how this particular story ends, you know that there's even room for the, at the Who's table for the Grinch. But we'll save that for next week. I think we're a lot like the Who's. We come in all shapes and sizes. We come from different backgrounds. We bring with us to this place different emotions and feelings. We bring with us different levels of grinchiness this time of year. And yet we are called to be in community with each other. Friends, there is room for all of us at God's table. And isn't that good news of great joy? You are invited here to feast on God's word, to indulge yourself in the lavish gift that is offered here to soak up the grace and love that is poured out each and every Sunday. And then you are called to go from this place, making your joy audible, proclaiming it so loud that the folks on top of Mount Crumpet can hear it. But the message that we are called to sing is not Yahoo Lore, but instead, Jesus Christ is born. There are Grinches out there, and maybe even a Grinch or so in here, who will try to steal our joy this Christmas season, but we can only, they can only do that if we let them. So let them instead choose to be who's this year. In times of plenty, in times of want, in times of celebration, in times of frustration, in times of grinchiness, and in times of great joy. Let us proclaim with our mouths and our lives the good news that we are to receive yet again this Christmas. Jesus Christ is born. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Friends, will you pray with me? Lord, we long for your salvation. Make a 
haste and help us. Come quickly with blessing and comfort for your people, O strong deliverer and the redeemer of the world. Clothe your church with the joy of your salvation. Cover it with the righteousness of Christ. Adorn it with the jewels of your word and sacraments. Through it, let the poor hear the good news, the sorrowful find comfort, and captives to sin and death experience your salvation. Restore the fortunes of Christians who are persecuted for confessing Jesus as Lord. Turn their weeping into rejoicing. Cause those who hate them to repent and believe in the good news. Bless and guide the people of this congregation. Give us faithful hearts, ears attentive to your word, eyes which to see that we'll see the needs of others, hands skilled in building up the body of Christ, and tongues swift to pray, forgive, and encourage. Anoint the rulers of the world with your spirit so that like you, they love justice and hate evil. Direct their words and their works in your truth. Until your great and acceptable day has dawned, good people must risk their lives for the sake of justice, liberty, and safety. Shield, strengthen, and direct them. Help them to serve with competence and integrity. Keep them from harm. Heal and raise them when they fall. Grant your healing to the brokenhearted and all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially those we name before you now, either aloud with our lips or silently in our hearts. Give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Strengthen all who care for them, and give them and all of us your everlasting joy. <coughs> Graciously answer our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, as we pray the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Well, friends, this is normally the time we would pass our offering plates around the sanctuary. We're not doing that just yet in this season of church life together. Instead, there's an offering plate uh, on your way out of the narthex. There's one here. Uh, up on the uh, up on the altar. Uh, if you haven't done so, want to come up and toss your, your offerings in. I know we've all had a little issue this morning getting his in there. He shot a lot like Carolina did yesterday. When they the Happens the best of them all four times. All right. But it's in appreciation of your continued giving and in anticipation of future giving, I want to offer to you this prayer at this time. Let us pray. God of love and life, just as John the Baptist came long ago in Judea to witness to your life, we remember that the offering you seek is that what we have and how we live should also witness to the light. We admit that there are times when we feel the darkness is just too prevalent, too strong, and then we realize that we are ignoring the call to witness to the light. May we be witnesses and witness through our giving and our compassion, through what we say and what we do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Closing hymn this morning is a one I think familiar to everybody. Hark the Herald Angels sing. It's on page 240 of our hymnal, and we'll sing verses 1 and 4. Verses 1. Wait a minute, only three verses. Uh-oh. One and three. We'll do one and three on page 240.
come to the end of our worship time together, I want to offer to you these words of our benediction. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us. We have been called, we have been anointed, we have been given a task to go out from this place into the mission field that is the world. We go carrying good news to the world. News about freedom from oppression and healing for the afflicted. The time of the Lord's favor is now. Hallelujah. Amen. 